we are counting down the 10 most catastrophic steam locomotive disasters ever recorded. Steam engines were the most romantic machines ever built, living, breathing giants of iron and fire. When these giants lose control, they do not simply break, they can erase everything in their path. From iron titans that shattered through city walls, to trains lost in the silence of mountain tunnels, each entry reveals a new way the age of steam pushed engineering and fate past the point of no return. Some failures began with a single broken bolt, others with a weakness hidden in the earth itself. In every case, entire lives changed in an instant, and the lessons forged in twisted metal redefined rail travel forever. Which disaster rewrote the rulebook for safety? Let us begin our journey at number 10. Paris, 1895. The Granville to Paris Express. Thunders toward its final stop at Montparnasse Station, running late and gathering speed at 40 miles per hour straight into the heart of the city. The driver pulls the brake lever. Iron shoes clamp against spinning wheels, but there is too much momentum. The platform is short. The buffer stops are old. The locomotive does not slow. It bursts through the barrier, shattering the stone wall, and comes to rest, hanging over the street below, a sight captured in a photograph that would become legend. One street vendor never made it home that day. The rest stood in stunned silence, staring at a machine that had flown. Engineers counted the cost in physics, kinetic energy, stopping distance, and the limits of 19th century brakes. After Montparnasse, railways began rethinking buffer stop design and demanded better brakes for every train. But this was only the beginning. Some disasters would test the very bones of the railway itself. December 29, 1876. A passenger train rolled across the Ashtabula River Bridge in Ohio, unaware that the very structure beneath it was about to give way. The bridge, designed with cast iron lugs connecting its Howe Trust members, concealed a floor invisible to the naked eye. A single lug, brittle from the start, fractured under the weight of the locomotive. In seconds, the entire span gave way, sending the locomotive, the cars, and the people aboard plunging into the icy ravine below. Investigators found that cast iron, chosen for its low cost and ease of casting, was riddled with microscopic weaknesses. The Ashtabula collapse forced engineers to confront the limits of Victorian materials. Afterward, steel, tested and certified, and far less brittle, became the new standard for bridges. Strict inspection regimes were born from this catastrophe, proving that the smallest flaw in iron could topple giants of wood and steel. Some lessons are written in twisted metal. June 12, 1889. A packed excursion train climbs the steep grade outside Armagh, Ireland, the locomotive straining against gravity. Halfway up, the locomotive stalls. The crew decides to divide the train, uncoupling the front cars to take them up first. But the vacuum brake system depends on a single unbroken pipe. The moment the coupling is separated, the rear section loses nearly all braking power. It begins to roll backward, gaining speed. The brakes are useless. Down the slope, a following train appears on the same track. There is no time to warn them. The runaway cars collide with devastating force, leaving the hillside covered with splintered wood and twisted iron. Around 80 souls never made it home. Parliament responded in record time and passed the Regulation of Railways Act. From then on, every passenger train in Britain required continuous automatic brakes, eliminating single-point failures and ending the practice of relying on gravity. The lesson was written into law. That failure was caused by gradient and a single point of failure. But the next disaster happened at zero miles per hour. December 4th, 1957. South London disappears into a wall of fog so thick that even the nearest lamp glows like a ghost. On the tracks near Lewisham, a commuter train slows for a red signal, hidden and invisible in the haze. The following train barrels forward, its driver searching for the stoplight that never appears. In seconds, iron meets iron. The collision is deafening. The fog, not the machinery, has become the enemy. Investigators find that even the sharpest eyes can fail when visibility drops below 50 yards. The old reliance on human sight and manual signals cracks under pressure. After Lewisham, the call for automatic train protection grew urgent. 
No more trusting a red lamp in the mist. Technology had to step in where human limits end. Railways across Britain accelerated the rollout of automatic train protection systems, reshaping safety so weather could no longer be an excuse. Christmas Eve, 1953. In the shadow of Mount Ruapehu, the Wellington to Auckland Express rushes north through the New Zealand night. The Tanguai Bridge stands silent above the Huangaihu River, its iron spans tested by decades of floods. Hours earlier, the volcano's crater lake burst its rim and released a laha, a black torrent of water, mud, and volcanic debris down the valley. The surge slams into the bridge piers, scouring away the riverbed and weakening the supports. Minutes before the express arrives, one pier gives way. The rail tracks hang in mid-air, held by nothing but memory. The locomotive charges onto the span. With a roar, the bridge collapses, plunging the engine and carriages into the churning river below. Investigators find twisted steel and shattered timbers. The real culprit is nature itself. The bridge was designed for ordinary floods, not for the catastrophic impact of volcanic debris. After Tangiwai, engineers rewrote the rules. Bridges near volcanoes must be monitored. Riverbeds must be checked for hidden threats. Laha warning systems became standard, forever changing how railways face the unpredictable power of the earth. But if rivers can destroy iron, what happens when the rails themselves vanish beneath the flood? May 22, 1915. Dawn breaks over the Scottish borderlands as the rails near Quinton's Hill signal box glint beneath a thin mist. Inside the cramped signal cabin, two men, James Tinsley and George Meakin, juggle a web of bell codes, handwritten logbooks, and the relentless pressure of wartime traffic. The early shift is already off kilter. Tinsley arrives late, missing the handover. Meakin, Distracted by conversation and the confusion of overlapping duties, lets routine slip. On the tracks outside, five trains converge. A troop train carrying nearly 500 Royal Scots, a local passenger, a coal train, and two express services. The system depends on absolute trust in human procedure, with no mechanical interlocking to prevent a wrong signal. The logbook records a premature train out of section bell, clearing a line that is still occupied. An empty coal train is allowed onto the upline, where a local passenger is waiting, shunted off the main. The troop train, made of flammable wooden carriages, approaches at speed as soldiers move toward Gallipoli. No warning reaches the driver. The collision is instant and catastrophic. Cars splinter, iron bends, fire erupts, fueled by gaslighting and varnished timbers. Within minutes, the devastation is total. The silence is broken only by the crackle of burning wood and the shouts of rescuers. Officially, at least 215 souls were lost. Some estimates reach 226. Only 58 of the Royal Scots answer roll call that afternoon. The Board of Trade dispatches Lieutenant Colonel Druitt to investigate. His report is clinical. The absence of absolute block interlocking allowed catastrophic errors to pass unchecked. Operators could override the system with a single lever, trusting memory over mechanism. The logbook, soaked with smoke and tears, lays bare every missed step. The board's verdict is swift. Absolute interlocking becomes mandatory across Britain. Procedures are rewritten, cabins are rebuilt, and the myth of infallible human vigilance is buried with the wreckage. Quinton Shill stands as the worst rail disaster in British history, a lesson carved in steel and flame. But the next catastrophe would not come from human hands. It would arrive with the river, silent and unstoppable. August 13, 1985. The Addis Ababa to Djibouti Express rolls south across the Ethiopian highlands, its carriages packed with travelers and traders. The train approaches the Awash River, where the rails snake over a series of bridges and embankments built decades earlier. On this day, the summer rains have been relentless. Floodwaters churn beneath the tracks, carving away at the earth that holds the railway above the gorge. Just past midnight, the leading locomotive crosses the bridge at Awash. Without warning, the embankment gives way. The rails drop out from under the wheels. Four carriages plunge into the river below, twisting as they fall. The sound of metal on stone echoes through the darkness. In the chaos, hundreds were lost, never making it home. 
The silence that follows is broken only by the rush of water and the distant shouts of rescuers scrambling down the muddy banks. Engineers investigating the wreck find the bridge supports scoured clean by the floodwaters. The drainage culverts are clogged with silt and debris and unable to channel the swollen river. Years of deferred maintenance and underfunded inspections left the railway exposed. The records show that the Awash Line, once a symbol of progress, had become vulnerable to the very forces it was built to conquer. In the aftermath, Ethiopian authorities ordered sweeping upgrades, new drainage systems, reinforced embankments, and more frequent inspections during the rainy season. This accident forced a change in rail standards. After this, rules for drainage, embankment reinforcement, and inspection frequency were tightened across the region, influencing railway safety practices for years to come. The Awash derailment stands as a warning to every railway built on shifting ground. When water undermines the tracks, even the strongest engine can be swept away. But what happens when disaster strikes in a place with no escape, deep underground, where air itself becomes the enemy? Night falls over southern Italy, March 2, 1944. A freight train, double-headed by two steam locomotives, pulls away from Bella Muro station and enters the army tunnel near Balvano. The air is thick with humidity, the rails slick with mountain dew. Nearly 2,000 meters of darkness swallow the train whole. Inside the tunnel, the engines struggle for traction. Wheels spin on wet steel, the heavy load refusing to budge. The crew opens the throttle and pours more coal into the fireboxes. Flames roar, smoke thickens, and the train comes to a halt, almost every carriage trapped deep underground. The tunnel, built for another era, offers little hope for fresh air. Its walls are close and its ceiling is low. Just hours earlier, another train passed through, leaving a haze of exhaust lingering in the stagnant atmosphere. There is no wind and no draft, only silence, and the slow, invisible spread of danger. The coal fueling the locomotives is not the black diamond of pre-war days. Wartime scarcity has filled the tenders with low-grade substitutes, heavy with impurities. As the engines idle, they belch out carbon monoxide, a gas with no color and no smell. Passengers, many of them stowaways seeking safe passage through the war-torn countryside, drift into uneasy sleep. Some sit upright, Others slump against the window glass, unaware that the air itself is changing. Carbon monoxide bonds with the oxygen-carrying molecules in the body, cutting off oxygen in silence. The crew, fighting to restart the train, grow dizzy and then go limp. The only warning is a creeping fatigue, a sense of weight pressing down, and then no response. Hours pass before the last car's brakeman dazed but alive, stumbles out of the darkness and makes his way back to Balvano Station. His story brings rescuers running, but the tunnel offers no easy entry. The first locomotive sent in cannot move the stranded train. The second finds most of the cars filled with stillness. Only a handful survive, those in the last wagons closest to open air. The investigation uncovers a chain of failures. Poor coal, wet rails, a tunnel with no ventilation, and the double-headed engine configuration that trapped exhaust instead of clearing it. The official report calls it an act of nature, but the facts tell a harder story. Wartime secrecy compounds the tragedy, news of the event is withheld for years, and the true toll is hidden from public view. More than 500 souls never make it home. The silence left behind is absolute. After Balvano, Italian railways impose strict weight limits on tunnel routes. Heavy trains require diesel assistance, and permanent guards monitor tunnel entrances, allowing passage only when the air is safe. The lesson is written not in twisted steel, but in the invisible chemistry of combustion. In the confined dark, it is not speed or collision that brings disaster, but the slow, silent asphyxiation that comes when exhaust cannot escape. Some dangers leave no mark but silence, and they force a new vigilance wherever iron meets stone and fire meets shadow. Romania, January 1917. The war has turned every railway into a lifeline. At Syria station, a troop train waits, already overloaded far beyond its design. Soldiers fill every carriage, spill into corridors, and crowd onto the steps. Some are wounded, 
others are refugees, each pressed into the crush by the demands of a nation at war. Regulations are ignored. The manifest means nothing. The only order that matters is to move as many as possible, as quickly as possible. The train pulls away at dusk, groaning under the weight of hundreds more than it was built to carry. The carriages sway and creak as the line curves south, picking up speed on the icy winter rails. Near the village of Turea, the track bends sharply. The overloaded cars strain against the couplings. The wheels, never meant for such a burden, lose their grip. In a flash, the train leaves the rails. Carriages tumble and break apart. Coal stoves tip, igniting fires that race through the wooden cars. The silence that follows is broken only by the crackle of flames and distant shouts for help. Within hours, the scene is cloaked in secrecy. Military sensors seal off the site and silence witnesses. Telegrams vanish from the record. Official statements mention only a railway incident. The true toll is hidden. Hundreds of souls were lost, perhaps as many as a regiment. Families wait for news that never comes. Only whispers pass through the towns and barracks. Too many never made it home. In the aftermath, Romanian authorities imposed strict new limits on train loads and required detailed manifests for every military movement. Wartime secrecy delayed these reforms, but the lesson was written in the twisted rails and the silence that followed. At Syria, it was not only steel that failed, but the very system meant to protect its people. Some disasters vanish from the headlines, but their consequences shape every journey that follows. Yet even this was not the end. In the mountains of France, a single train would soon face a descent so steep that no brake could hold it back. December 12, 1917. A military leave train snakes through the French Alps, packed with soldiers, finally heading home from the Italian front. The line from Modane to Saint-Michel-de-Maurienne drops steeply over a 3% grade, enough to test any machine. 19 wooden coaches, overloaded with more than 1,000 men, are hitched to a single steam locomotive. Regulations called for two engines on this descent, but the second was reassigned at the last minute. The driver objected, but the order stood. Only the first three cars had air brakes. The rest relied on hand brakes, scattered among seven brakemen, each waiting for a whistle signal in the night. As the train began its descent, the driver eased the throttle, holding speed at 10 km per hour. But gravity does not forgive. The brakes overheated, friction faded, and the train accelerated, 40, then 60, then 84 miles per hour. The wooden cars lurched and swayed, sparks flew from the wheels. Just outside Saint-Michel, the coupling snapped. Cars left the rails, piled into each other, and ignited, as candles, overheated brakes, and hidden munitions fed the fire. The devastation was nearly total. Only 183 men answered roll call the next day. Official reports mention 425 were lost. Historians count as many as 800 souls who never made it home. Wartime censorship buried the truth for years. In the aftermath, French railways overhauled brake standards. Automatic brakes became mandatory and overloaded trains on mountain lines were banned. The lesson was written in the gradient. A single failure could erase an entire regiment. The silence in the valley lingered long after the fire burned out. Across all ten disasters, one pattern endures. Every tragedy began with a small failure, a missed signal, a pressure spike, or a single overloaded car. The true threat wasn't the machines, but the limits of human attention and system design. Today, every safe journey owes its legacy to these lessons written in steel. The age of steam reminds us progress is paid for, one hard lesson at a time.